Okay, so today joining us, um, Terry Ross by video. Krista Sievertson is here with us live and I'll be talking a bit too. Um, we're gonna be talking about overcoming obstacles in considering assistive technology when collaborating. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some common obstacles, then um, we'll hear a story from Terry by video and then Krista will also tell us some stories and some solutions to some obstacles they've come across. But one of the common obstacles that I see with teams a lot is the ability to be able to do training, um, both because of the time effect, which I'll talk about in just a second, and then also just um, the depth of training that sometimes is needed when we're looking at assistive technology. But so some of the solutions I've seen teams come up with, which um, are pretty creative at times, are to, if you're looking at tools, use a known tool or draw parallels to that known tool so that like the knowledge isn't as drastically different. For example, if you're teaching a student to use Google Docs, the person might not be familiar with Google Docs, but they might be familiar with Microsoft Word. So um, kind of drawing the parallels between those pieces. Um, or using something that um, is, is a little more familiar. Also, just want to say normalize being uncomfortable. Explicitly talk about that. Being comfortable with discomfort <laughs> sometimes is really uncomfortable when we're trying new tools. And we know that all the team members are going to go through some moments where things are not comfortable. They aren't quite sure what's going on and that we're all in that boat um, at some point. So just normalizing that that's that's part of the process. Um, having quick online videos, I've found that if you can keep a video to just a few minutes, people are much more likely to be able to watch that training video, either kind of, you know, getting it in in between things um, or even just being willing to click on that, that link to watch it. Um, and then in YouTube, you know, when you share a video, you can choose the start at point. Sometimes it's like you don't need them to watch the two minute intro that this particular vendor or whatever put about how to use their tool. So you can do the start at so that it starts two minutes in and then they only have to watch the duration of it. Um, again, just kind of minimizing the amount of time. And Julie, I would add in too, whenever I send a video to someone, I tell them how long it is in the email that I'm sending them or the link. I, I say, this is only three minutes. Brilliant. You get someone to click on it a lot more likely than if they know that they're going to be watching a half hour video. Yeah. Really. Um, scheduling time for practice. Sometimes this can be helpful. Um, sometimes it's a hindrance. We'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide, but sometimes it's easier if you can get the whole team to actually schedule a time to be able to practice it. One, so that you can be uncomfortable together if there's some discomfort surrounding that. Um, and then also two, sometimes things just don't happen unless we've got them scheduled. So making sure that something's on the calendar can be really helpful. And as I often say in the end of my slides, you know, choose your one new thing, you know, start small. Um, don't start with making something happen. For example, if you're trying to integrate a, a particular AT tool into a student's day, don't start doing it across every moment of every day. Pick a tiny little time when they can be using it in a very specific way. Um, and then you'll be able to build over that. Um, we know that in building habits, the smaller we can start, the better. Um, and so making sure that you're having success to start out with and that people aren't feeling overwhelmed. Another common obstacle for collaboration is time. Um, we know they're not making more of it in the days, so um, it's a big one. Some possible solutions, again, that I've seen teams come up with are using online documents and notes so that you can check whenever you get a minute in between things um, so that you don't have to um, necessarily schedule a time in your day, although that can be helpful. But this is just if you want to check what's going on, you know, sharing your data collection notes, if you're doing them digitally, um, things like that. And also this can be helpful with sharing information with parents, then you don't necessarily have to schedule as many regular meetings, not that those aren't important for other reasons. But um, it's a nice way to keep families updated too. Oh, I had that as a bullet point. Um, and then you know, like I said, sometimes you can't schedule a time, but sometimes scheduling a time, even that short time, 
or even a check-in date um, can get something on the calendar and, and help with that accountability factor. Um, so again, you know, in talking with teams, it's like sometimes it can go either way. It's like, we don't want to schedule something. We don't need another thing on the calendar. Or sometimes it's like, I won't do it unless there is something on the calendar. So you have to kind of check in with your teams and see what they're most comfortable with. And sometimes trial and error too. And I would also say just really simplification has helped with teams, um, especially things like for data collection, make it check boxes, not writing a four paragraph essay about how the, how the student is doing with something, um, especially in a classroom when a lot of things are happening for a teacher or a para to be able to just check a box of what particular item it was, you know, if that fits in with an IEP goal or objective, just to be like, okay, it goes with this one, even just having, you know, versus having to handwrite those pieces in. Sometimes that tiny little difference can make a big difference as is to how willing people are, are to actually engage with the things and take the time. Um, meeting online, this is, I mean, I know that at least in my district and in many other districts that I know that I've talked to people in, um, meeting online has saved a ton of time. Um, that windshield time for those of us who are itinerant can be a real time grabber. So being able to meet online, you can pop right into things real quickly. Another piece is sometimes information is everywhere. And it's like, where did I do that? What did I, where did I store that? Things are all over the place. These are pretty common ones. You know, sometimes people have Google Forms even as their data collection sheet. So if people are using technology all the time, say they have Chromebooks with them all the time, it might be that every time you work with a student, you might, um, you might just use a Google form to enter your data collection and then it's automatically stored there. Same with Google Docs, same idea, um, or putting things in a shared drive or even having like one folder for a particular student or for a particular class or tool that you're working with. Um, and then I find it helpful too as we, um, when we're emailing or talking with people or even in Google Meet, just sharing those links is really helpful um, and making sure that you're copying and pasting those links or putting them in any documents that you're sharing. Um, just because sometimes having to go into Drive and search for those things, that one little step can sometimes be an obstacle for people. So um, just making sure you're sharing those direct links. Um, and then it doesn't always have to be high tech. For many of us, high tech works great and that's easier for us to store and organize. But depending on the setting and depending on your team member, sometimes it's easier to go low tech um, or no tech, you know, use a clipboard or a file folder um, or, you know, pocket folders, whatever, whatever works best. Um, but it's just kind of that organization piece that can really help with collaboration. So, and making sure that all the team members know where that information is shared. You know, this is for this kid, we're keeping all of this stuff in this file folder that's gonna be stored on the shelf in the room. Um, so yeah, again, whatever works for your team and make sure, making sure you're communicating that piece out. I know in our first um, session in this series, communication was a high point of important collaboration elements. And so making sure that all those pieces are communicated. All right, next we're gonna look at a video from Terry Ross. I'm gonna mute myself so we don't get echoing here. And she is going to share a story about a recent experience she had. Hi, my name is Terry Ross. I'm an occupational therapy assistant in the Duluth Public Schools. And I am an avid technology user. Um, I recently was involved with some team members who we wanted, we had a new student come and he had some, uh, some technology listed on his IEP. And um, so I talked with the special ed teacher to ask her about um, getting this the technology for him to use and she said yeah that would be great so then i thought well i better check with the speech teacher because it was communication tools and she said oh i thought the special ed teacher was getting it <laughs> so just like knowing who's doing what if we would in hindsight i should have sent a group email instead of contacting people individually 
Um, and so then when I looked on our lending library, the tools had already been checked out. <laughs> and so I then sent a group email and the teacher thought that we were getting a different tool. So just knowing some of the names of the tools or coming up with some common names, like I thought the student was using a step-by-step -step switch and the teacher thought he was using a head switch, which I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure what you're thinking. So then when we had some visuals or were able to um, communicate as a team, we were able to get the tools in place that the student needed. So what we learned is <laughs> to maybe do things more as a group and um, yeah, that seemed to work out well. And now we were able to get the tools and try the tools with the student all together. So that was my recent experience with a little, uh, with that collaboration for a student. Hi, my, my name, name is Terry Ross. Ross. I'm an occupational, occupational therapy, therapy assistant in the Duluth, Duluth Public Schools. Go to the next one here. Um, so thanks, Terry Ross, for that video. She wasn't able to attend today, but wanted to make sure she could share that story with us. Um, so again, the obstacles that she saw there was kind of not knowing who was responsible for what tasks, and there were some miscommunications about tools. Um, but the team found some solutions, talking together, meeting at the same time helped for them, having that um, synchronous discussion time. Um, a group email was something that she mentioned. Again, depending on your team can be a great method of communication. Sometimes it doesn't work for people, but um, checking with your team on what their preferred communication methods are. Um, they developed some common language and needed visuals to know exactly what those tools were that they were talking about. And then they explicitly decided on who was going to do what. This is a pretty common thing. Um, and, you know, like on the ISD 709, um, the set framework forms that we have, the process forms, AT consideration process forms that we have, um, have a space on there for who's going to be doing which part of this um, implementation and trial process. Um, but you can do this in Google Docs too. You can assign a person to a piece by tagging them in the document. Um, so that's part of the piece about just knowing explicitly who's going to be doing which pieces. One, so you aren't doubling up on things and then also so you aren't missing things. So thanks again, Terry, for that story. Um, they also had follow-up discussions, just another last point on there. All right, and I will turn it over to Krista for her story next. Tell me when to turn the slides, Krista. Great. So um, if you were with us last week when we talked about successful collaboration, um, I started telling the story about um, a modification that we were making for a student. Um, he was a middle school student uh, who was autistic, and it, he had an art project where he needed to create a bowl and um, the assignment was to sculpt the bowl from clay and add textures and then glaze it and have it fired. And um, he let us know right away that he was not going to do this project. He was um, had sensory issues with touching the clay. Um, so we had initially tried to find um, some different solutions of other types of materials he could use, and it just wasn't um, happening for him. So, um, kind of thinking outside the box, I um, asked his teacher if she would accept uh, um, a bowl that was created digitally and 3D printed. And she said that would be great. You know, she could, he could still use the same, um, you, you know, add texture and he could paint it when it was done. Um, she was just fine with that. And so then I reached out to some of his team members. We started a group email um, and you know, said, is anybody familiar with any programs that would work? And his um, home base teacher, like kind of like a homeroom teacher that he sees every day, um, said that he was familiar with Tinkercad. So we decided to go with Tinkercad. I did find another option out there called ZBrush Core that's a little bit more kind of artsy, um, looks, has more of a sculptury look to it. So if you're ever looking for this type of modification for a student, you could use that one instead. Um, but I, did some searching around on for Tinkercad and actually found a tutorial for um, making a basic bowl within the program. So um, the first thing that I did to try to get all of the team members together um, was to get 
everybody on this email. And then I made a checklist for the student um, to log into Tinkercad. You'll see up there on the, on the screen, watch the video about just how to use the program, then watch the bowl video. You need to create it, add details, 3D print it, paint the bowl, and then turn it into his art teacher, um, which is kind of a lot of steps um, for something that he's never done before. Um, so I tried to make sure the art teacher was looped in and the uh, teacher who was um, going to be helping him with it, his um, home base teacher. But then we ran into some issues. Um, the home base teacher was then out for quite a while ill. Um, and the we had talked about giving him the opportunity to go to the resource room to do his project and um, failed to make sure the resource room knew all of the information that we'd been sharing with the rest of the team. So if you click to the next slide, I can kind of tell you how where, where things ended up. Um, so what I did was um, went back and um, made sure that all of the people were involved that were involved. So the resource room para and the resource room teacher were involved in the um, the discussion. And then I took that step-by-step -step checklist and um, turned it into a shared Google Doc for all of the team members and the student, and then also added which team members were responsible for which piece. So um, who was going to be checking in with the student to make sure he was um, watching the videos and when he would be doing that in the resource room. Um, who was going to be um, troubleshooting any of the Tinkercad? That was his um, home base teacher. Who would be helping with the 3D printing? That was our technology integration specialist was helping out with that. Um, so just making sure we knew who um, was doing what because the team was so big that it just got completely lost. And like a week later I checked in and nothing had been done yet. Um, so, <laughs> What ended up happening was um, we got all this in place. We were ready to go with the student. And turns out he just really didn't want to do this assignment. Um, he didn't want to do any of it anyway. So what he did was he took the clay home. He didn't want to do it in the art room, and he didn't want to be in the art room. Um, so he took the clay home, and you made his bowl at home out of clay, even after we did all of this. <laughs> so. We learned a lot of lessons, and um, you know, one of them is making sure we really know why we're doing what we're doing this for, and uh, making sure that it's the appropriate um, tool for the task. Uh, so, in this case, you know, we we got all gung ho and got excited about it, and it didn't even end up being what the student actually needed. It's what he told us he needed initially, and his family. Um, but it we you know. Things like that happen sometimes, but now we have a really great idea for um, in case we come up with um, this kind of an issue again in our class. <laughs> Krista, I love that story. And it's like, you know, best laid plans, right? You can put everything in place and then it's, mm -hmm. you, know, you just got to punt sometimes. Um, yep. Ultimately, the student outcome was exactly what you wanted. So mm -hmm. Win-win yep. situation. And yeah, I think again, like learning from that process. So that's good. Um, Shannon just put in the in the chat window. So funny. I didn't see that coming. Me neither. Like I literally, you I don't know if you guys could see me. I was like laughing, <laughs> laughing over here. Um, that's yeah the twist in the story there. So yeah. Um, I would love to open it up. Um to... okay. there is one more. Oh, is there? Oh, great, great. Yeah, yep. Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Krista. Yes. So this is one uh, story that I had um, put out just some questions to my staff, seeing if anybody had um, something that they wanted to share. And this was um, a team that was working together with a second grade student um, in the um, PI category. And he had been learning to use his communication device with SNAP plus core primarily at home. And um, was and during distance learning, did great with it. It was so awesome. Um, he was really communicating well. Um, but his parent was there, really able to support it quite a bit. And then when the student came back to school after distance learning, it just kind of got lost. Staff were forgetting to to use it and not remembering what was on the device and, and what they, um, you know, when to pull it out or what to do. 
Um, so the team it came together to try to figure out like, so how can we um, get this to be used more? Um, and it was the special ed teacher, the speech language pathologist. Um, we have an AAC specialist who um, can go in and help support with our devices, um, his paraprofessional and um, also uh, the parents. So the um, one of the solutions that they came up with was the AAC specialist printed and laminated the students' pages for the staff so that they could reference those pages um, and look back at them and know what was on the device. Because, you know, it's like hidden underneath several different menus sometimes. You've got to click in this and then find the other page. So um, they could know which words were on there and which, um, and then also if the device wasn't working or wasn't charged, they would have those pages that they could pull out and at least point to and use as a little more low tech um, communication. Um, then um, also just kind of continuing to work with the student to get him used to using the AC, AAC and pulling it out when he needs to use it versus um, just trying to say what he wants over and over again and getting frustrated because he does have some um, you know, mouth words that he uses to, to communicate, but um, they're not as effective as the AAC for him. So just continuing on um, to encourage him to use it. Then um, also the AAC specialist is able to go to class with him one time a week. And um, she goes to his morning meeting and is able to help him um, just encourage him to use this device, locate words, show him how to integrate with the class and show the class how they can use it together. Um, and then uh, the team has been meeting bi-weekly and is continuing to meet to um, touch base and see how things are going. And um, it's a quick check-in, um, but just making sure everybody's still on track and see if there's anything that needs to be added or, or updated. So it's still a work in progress, um, but that's where our team is with that. Great. I'm going to actually, Krista, that's another great story. Um, I, I'm always taken aback by these things that we sometimes think or take for granted about um, the teaming situation, the collaboration process. And then it's like you, you just do like one little switch, one little turn in things. And it's like, OK, all right, now we have to rethink everything. But sometimes those tiny little changes um, can also be the thing that just solves the problem, too. So um, thank you for sharing those great stories with us. Um, yeah, so I'll, I now I'll open it up unless, Kristen, do you have another third story? Just kidding. No, that's it for um, me. <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll open it up now to anyone um, sharing any other stories or any questions or answers about collaboration and the obstacles to that sometimes. Julie Ray, I don't have any questions, but um, I would just reiterate some of the things you said earlier on. Um, I work with other teachers. And I think some of the ideas you had about keeping the videos very short is extremely helpful. I um, do make some screencast tutorials and if I keep them between two and four minutes, people will watch them. Beyond that, it's much harder um, to get staff to engage. And then um, sending out emails with links is huge and keeping it very simple because everybody's short on time. So I just try to make it as easy as possible for um, teachers to get the information they need. Beautiful. Thanks, Shannon. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. But thank you so much for joining us and for presenting some great information with us today, Krista.